y'all to meet Jean Cribb. Oh, bless you. Jean is a special, special woman. And when I was teaching at Arlington, I kept hearing things about Stephen Cribb, her son, who uh, was a pistol. <laughs> and I knew that I, he was going to come into my life and he was going to come into my room. Well, they, sometimes Stephen wound up because I, he was across the hall. He and if he, mis, if he misbehaved, he came and the teacher was kind of throwing up her hands with him. And so she would say, and I'd say, well, Connie, just send him over to me. And he could just sit in our room and just chill. So he started coming over. All of a sudden, he would appear in the room. And he'd sit at a certain seat. And he would uh, continue to draw. He always drew while he listened. He never missed a beat. And he liked my class. So I don't know if he misbehaved more so he could come over. But <laughs> anyway, so I thought, OK, this will be interesting. He, so he came over the next year. He was in my class. We're, we're talking eighth grade English. And so he's, I, I thought, OK, Stephen, I know you used to sit over there, but now you're going to sit right here next to me at my, my, my desk. And uh, he would draw. And I, that kind of threw me off, because I'm the type of person, and I know it's very controlling. I want you to look at me when we're, you know, with the teacher. I want you to listen. I want you to be aware. I want to be able to look at, you know, whatever. And he's drawing beautiful things, very gifted artist. And I was, put the pen down. Stop that. Listen to me. I'm trying to tell you something. And it uh, didn't work. The pen kept on drawing. And I realized, because I would stop, and I'd say, what did I just say? And he'd repeat it, and I'd think, let him draw, Becky, let him draw. <laughs> He's hearing. He's hearing. And that's the way. And there are people who learn that way. So that was Stephen. And we just had, uh, he just became a favorite because he was listening. And he was very bright. And so we just had that friendship. And you do have those friendships. And so I'm thankful. Well, he was one of my favorites. He really was. I'm glad he came my way, and I'm glad I went his way. You never know where God is putting you, right? Absolutely. And don't think he's not at work. He is. Um, I, I didn't say, Peggy, when you were talking about the books, I didn't say anything about, I'd be glad to sign any book you want me. I signed Celine Sparks books. I sign. <laughs> I don't put Celine Sparks. I put Becky. <laughs> but I'll put a message. And then, and then, um, <laughs> Here I have Portrait of God, Frank Chesser, who is a wonderful, do you, Gene, do you remember him coming to Forest Park? And he would ho hold meetings for us, and Frank Chesser is one of mine, and his books are deep, and he would come and stand, if you ever, he's in Montgomery, Alabama, and he would stand, just before he started to jump into his lesson, it was like he was mesmerized, he focused on something on the back wall, and he started quoting the Bible, and pretty soon you realized, oh, he's, he's in Matthew 1. Or he's in Luke 14, and you go, he didn't, he would memorize the Bible. He just had that talent. Well, his book, Portrait of God, I think we've got two copies, and this is one of them. He's written several books, Peggy, um, Thinking Right About God, uh, Questions from Isaiah. Questions from Christ is the newest one, right? And he, he just keeps on turning out these books. Uh, Ken and Lynn Golson gave us the book Portrait of God. And what I love about his book on Portrait of God is that he goes through every book of the Bible and shows how you were meant to be saved. I love that. Now, that's hard to do. That's hard work, isn't it, girls? Don't you think it is? I think so. And I, I, I appreciate Frank and the work that he does. I love Celine Sparks. You know her. She's very funny, but she is down to earth. No nonsense when it comes to God's word. And, of course, her last one is, if mama ain't happy. And how does the saying go, girls? If mama ain't happy. Is that true in your house? <laughs> I, uh, my daughter and I were at... Um, an antique, antique shop one time, and there were signs in this, I love signs, and one of the signs said, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, and the other one said, right beside it, and if daddy ain't happy, who cares? <laughs> okay, this is Celine's, it just says, if mama ain't happy, thank you, Celine. Uh, I want to say something about Brenda Porch's book, Private Matters, this is on sex for and talking about Christian women and girls, and I'm so thankful she wrote it. I am. It's very uh, plain. It's explicit. It is. And I think it's about time 
a Christian woman wrote this. I'm so thankful. There are several books back there by J.J. Turner. Do any of you know J.J.? He's at McDonough. And he has written some books like Elders wake, Shepherds Wake Up, Deacons Wake Up, Preachers Wake Up, Teenagers Wake Up, Parents Wake Up, but my favorite, Christians Wake Up. Now I'm going to tell you something that may, you, may, you may think this isn't the truth. You find it hard to believe, but maybe you won't. I'll have to see if you nod your head. The church is asleep. It is. The church is asleep. We've got to wake up. We gotta light the fire again. He uh, tells it like it is, and one of the things that he says, I'll just kind of paraphrase it. He says, we all act like we're on, we're on the good ship lollipop. And he said, and instead we're on the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, we need to think about it. Some women will come up to me and say, Becky, is there anything out there on that table for uh, young men? Yeah, I've given this to my grandsons. Boys to Men, written by, I don't know how many chapters there are, are in it, probably at least 10 or 11 written by young Christian men, two young Christian men. Thank you. And then for something for girls, we've got Secrets of Leadership for Young Women by Teresa Hampton, God's Girls. I appreciate good books. They're not expensive. You'd send more, you would spend more on a present at Walmart, you know? And they are easy to give, and they're good things. Girls, you know, Brother Keeble would talk about expanding the brain, and that's what we need to do. That's what, we are, that's what we're about, because I've, I will tell you, and you, you, you can nod your head on this one, I hope you do. Have you started losing your memory yet? <laughs> you sweet young chickens aren't gonna know that. It happens when you have children. It happens in labor and delivery. The doctors must give you something because you, walk, you, you rolled out of there, you know, whatever. I, 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 one of the things that I like to do, I love the books, but I want to say this is part of my ministry that I talk to women about, and I just want to briefly talk about it. My mother was my best friend, and it's okay to have your mother as your best friend, but I also knew when she said something, oh, you better hop. You better jump because it went. You had to do what she's. You never told her no. And if I ever heard Rebecca Lee, you better get over here. Oh, oh, when she uses my full name. Oh, I was in big trouble. I was raised on her lap. I was the third of three children, and the only time I ever got her to myself was in church. She was so busy, a deacon's wife, busy doing this, teaching an evangelist. She's always teaching, teaching, teaching. And so my time with her was limited. So I got her, you know, services. And so I would sit on her lap, and nobody got to sit on her lap but me. And, uh, when she, and she was always very encouraging. This is something you need to do for the preacher or a teacher. Whenever they're saying something you really, really, really do like, or even that's just, yeah, you're great, nod your head and encourage him. And so my mother was always nodding her head, and I'd nod my head. <laughs> and then she'd shake her head, and I'd shake my head. And then one time, and my mother had a wonderful voice. She was a music teacher. And um, we were singing. I don't remember this. It was a little tiny thing. And she was singing, and she swallowed a fly. <laughs> And I said, well, Mama, what did I do? And she said, you stood up on my lap and opened up my mouth and looked down my throat. <laughs> and I did. I, said, I, I loved being with her. I loved her teaching. She was my favorite teacher. She was a mentor. I loved her so. I'm going to show her. I'll show you a little bit about Lee Fowler. This is the way she, she said, Becky, whenever, because I would call her if I didn't understand a passage or something the preacher had said, Mama, Mama, we got to call. We got to talk. Or if she were in front of me, this is, this is how she would say it. Whenever a teacher or a preacher teaches something that I don't know, I don't understand, and here's where she'll pop out. She said, you know what I do? I go after it. I get out the Greek and the Hebrew, and I read the original text. And then I get out every Bible that I have, every version that I have, and I read that passage. And then I get out commentaries. And I see what men have to say about that particular passage. But I remember they're men. 
so that at the end of the day, I got a handle on that passage. Do you know what that is? That's a pearl seeker. That's wanting to know more. And I always attribute it or liken it to this. Did you ever ask your parents, and sometimes it's an assignment from school, did you ever ask your parents, or what was it like in World War II, Dad? My dad was on a hospital ship. My dad was a medic. And so he would tell you about what it was like being on a hospital ship with the wounded. Mama, what was it like for you when they came and told you that your brother had been killed? Mama, what was it like to have little babies? You had Tom and Judy. You didn't have me yet. What was it like to be all alone raising them and just getting a letter once in a while from Dad? Well, you know, your parents just zoom in, don't they? She's wanting to know about me. Can you imagine how God feels when you take his word and you say, tell me more, show me, change my life? It means everything. So that's the way we are. That's the kind of feelings that we have. And when my mother opened up her Bible, she would underline it in the back where there's blank pages. It was how to tell somebody, to teach somebody. She had lessons on how to teach them the gospel, how to mark your Bible, things that a famous preacher had said or just a regular teacher that changed her life, what the Greek word was for that. And she had it all marked up. And I said, Mama, if I take your Bible and squeeze it, I know that ink will just pour all over my toes. <laughs> she had bought me a Bible that was just exactly like hers. New American Standard, about 1975. And so, literally, when we were studying the Bible, we were on the same page. I loved her Bible, but it was filled with all kinds of things. And I told her, Mama, when, <clears throat> when, you, when you get older and you decide to give up things, I want your Bible. She said to me, you want my Bible? And I said, yeah. And she said, I thought you wanted all those wonderful antique rose dishes I brought back from New England. And I said, well, I want those too. <laughs> My mother had macular degeneration, and she lost her eyesight. And she was a diabetic. And she slowly started to drift away from us with dementia. Whether it's Alzheimer's, you know they don't know until you're gone sometimes. And I would pray to God, can I have her back? I need her back. Don't let her go. Have you seen the notebook? It was like that, having mom and dad. They died seven months apart. It was like that. She, I bought her a big, huge phone. You remember the ones that hung on the wall? <laughs> Some young chicks don't remember that. <laughs> Telephones hung on the wall. And it had big numbers about this big. One, two, three, four, five, six. She knew that if she hit one, she hit me. Now, this was before she forgot who I was. But if she hit one, in my, she was in Noonan. I was in Fayetteville. And so I would hear the phone, and I would go and answer the phone. I didn't have caller ID, and I would hear. Now, this is when she's drifting back and forth in her world and another world. And I would say, hello, and this is how my mother would call me. I just called to say I love you. <laughs> and what was I supposed to say? And I just called to say how much I care. Stevie Wonder. We love Stevie Wonder. And I say, hey, Mama. How are you? Oh, precious, I'm so fine. And she'd be talking. And I'd think, she's back. And she was back for just a little bit. I don't call Alzheimer's the long goodbye. I call it the longest goodbye. I just wanted her back. In the meantime, she had given me her Bible. And so I took her Bible, and I set it on the side on my bedside table. Because I'm one of these, I'm the night owl. Anybody relate to being the night owl? You don't like mornings, you want to sleep in. Yes, that's me. So I had her Bible, and, and I love to read from the Bible, the last thing I do at night. Well, as I'm going through this heart-wrenching experience with her, I start grabbing her Bible at night. And I would read the most wonderful book, the Bible anyway. And then I'd read a footnote of what a preacher had said about that passage that meant a lot to mom that caused her to grow. Hmm. And I would look at the back and I'd see how to teach somebody the truth. Now here's the blessing. Now y'all listen to me on this. My prayer was answered. 
Can I have her back? I had her back. She was there telling me, look at that passage, Becky. Look at what God's saying. Watch it. Be careful. So my plea, and the one comfort thing I want to give to you all is this. Don't ever, ever, ever give up on God. He's working in your life. You just can't see it. But remember, it's always his time. It's not your time. And sometimes, don't we want it to be our time? We're a very uh, time-conscious, we want things yesterday, society. But God says, no, it's when I'm ready that I will give that to you. So you take that Bible that you love so much. I love the pages. I love the notes. And you start writing things in it that perhaps that's your favorite passage. When my grandchildren were born, I would find a passage in Psalms that meant so much to me, and I would say, Lex, you were born. And put the date down. I'm thinking about you today. Whenever I read that, I'm thinking about you too. One woman came up to me from Alabama, and she said, Becky, I heard you say that about the Bible. And so she said, I have a daughter, Lauren, who just turned 16, and I found something I really wanted her to focus on. And I said, Lauren, this is your birthday today. When, so that when you and I are long gone, our daughters and our granddaughters, our grandsons, will pick up our Bibles, and they'll see God's Word, and then they'll see, oh, that is a very special passage. You don't know what God's going to do. And this is so important. Your Bible is so important. Leave your own commentary. Leave a legacy to where our children can identify. We are only here for what amount of time, girls? It is, and it's gone. So do that. Make that one of the things that you do, is that you underline and you uh, put things that made you grow. I was reading in Mama's Bible one night. I think it was in the book of Exodus. And it's the scripture said, and the people promised Moses they would do everything the Lord had commanded. And my mother wrote in the, out in the margin, but not for long. <laughs> Crack me up. <laughs> then I was reading about, you remember Samson? Do you remember Samson? Do you remember how God describes him? Son of whom? Who's his dad? David. Oh, I'm sorry. I said Samson, didn't I? Absalom. Sorry. That was Manoah. Good. Good girl. Okay, this one is Absalom. His father is David. What does God tell you about Absalom? He was beautiful from the top of his head to the what? Sole of his feet. And it also tells you that he had gorgeous hair. How often did he cut it, girls? Once a year. And then God tells you how much it weighed. God really tells you, you know, I think he must have been a hunk. <laughs> so mother had written outside a thought of hers, you know, describing his long hair, and she had said, the first hippie. <laughs> she had a sense of humor, yes, yes, she had a sense of humor. So I just wanted to say that that hopefully you will remember some of these things. Oh, and you wanted to know some Latin. Well, how about Wainy Weedy Winky? Can you say, say it? Wainy? Wainy. We, weedy. Weedy. Winky. Winky. I came, I saw, I conquered. Oh. Yeah. See if you can figure out what I'm saying. Ego excello unitorum statuum americae acre publicae quam referred ipsum fidelitato. Uni nationi subweo individual. Indiv you know, I can't remember that. I've forgotten. Subwayo, indivisibly, cum libertate, atque justitia, omnibus. It's the Pledge of Allegiance. And so every time we were in Miss Grossman's class, and it was first period, and we said the Pledge of Allegiance, we had to say it in Latin with her. Oh, she was tough. Tough stuff. Anyway, it's exciting. I want you all to stand up. If you can, if you can't, that's all right. But those who, who can, stand up. You're going to do an exercise with me. It's real short. You'll like it. I hope you do. But if you don't, don't tell me. Okay. <laughs> Hold your nose. And put your one head over your, up here. And then on the count of three, I want you to give a little hop. Hop. Are you ready? One, two, three, hop. Okay, sit down. 
Now, what you did was you just jumped in the deep end. <laughs> How many learned something from the first session? Did you learn something? Good little chickens. <laughs> Don't stop now. Don't stop now. I mean this. The, the funny story, this isn't a joke. This is a true story. How many of you remember Reader's Digest? Do you remember uh, the United States? What, life in the United States. It's lost weight, by the way. If you see it, it's a tiny little thing. And my mother loved this story, and she told it so much, I just I have to tell it, too, because I think it's so funny. It's the true story of a woman having a baby. And she makes it to the hospital, and she has the baby in the elevator. And so there's a male nurse <clears throat> in the elevator with her, and he delivers the baby. And she keeps saying, oh, I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry I didn't make it up to delivery. I'm just so sorry. And he said, ma'am, it's okay. Why, do you know that last year, some lady had her baby out on the front lawn of our hospital, and she said, oh, that was me too. <laughs> Don't you love that story? It's true. <laughs> Oh, that was me too. Let's stop and have a prayer. Father, we love to laugh. Thank you for giving us the gift of laughter. Thank you for this moment in time. Help me not to teach anything that's wrong. Help me not to say anything you wouldn't want me to say. Fill our hearts with your love. May we look like you, Father. We thank you for you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have thine own way, Lord. Have Is that easy for you? You're going to wait on the Lord. That's hard. But yielded and still, just mold me into whatever you need, but I will wait. That's hard. Write down Exodus 14, 14. Have you still got a pen? Let me see. Have you got paper? Good. Have you still got a Bible? Good. Good. Exodus 14, 14 is one of those passages that is so powerful. And I hope that when we get to heaven, we see these things quoted. This is said when, Mo when Moses is, uh, and the Israelites are getting ready to cross the Red Sea and they see Pharaoh in the distance. And so what does he say? The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be, do you know what the next word is? Still or quiet. See, that's hard for us. It's hard for us to be still and it's hard for us to be quiet. But oh, girls, now we have jumped into married and children and golden years and leaving the, and of course, the empty nest. Write it down, God loves women. He loves you. He loves me. And he wants us to be happy. Now, I want you to write this down. Satan wants us. You ready? Satan wants us depressed. Satan wants us miserable. Insecure. Satan wants us insecure, miserable, and what? Depressed. But God wants us secure, positive, joyful, happy, happy people. Who are we going to listen to? I love Brother Keeble said. He said once, God voted for you. Satan voted against you. Now you get to cast the deciding vote. Isn't that smart? Isn't that true? Absolutely. It's up to us to choose what we will live, how we will live, the manner of what we'll let in our doors, how we're going to talk, how we're going to behave. Cicely Tyson says in the movie The Help, if every day you are not dead in the grave, dead in the ground, you are going to have to make some decisions. And you are. Listen to this. How many of you have ever seen the Power for Today little booklet, magazine, whatever, you know, our church gets them. And 
we uh, take them and I give them out if I can. And in this power for today, here is what a man has to say about women. I say I'm always fascinated by how men view us. His name is, I believe, Charles, and he lives in Owasso, Oklahoma. He says, my grandma Reynolds showed me the way of the Lord. My mother taught me the gospel of Christ. My wife is escorting me to heaven, and my daughter holds fast to the teachings of Jesus, and my sister-in-law loves the Lord's church. How fortunate I am. This is great. What did I do to, what did I deserve, do to deserve to be around such godly women? I made the choice to surround myself with them. Boaz married Ruth because he learned of her loyalty and willingness to serve the God of Israel. He also knew the character of her mother-in-law, Naomi, and chose to surround himself with godly women. What did that do for him? Meaning Boaz. It redeemed him, saved him, and led him into the lineage of whom, girls? Christ. What did Queen Esther do when confronted with the extinction of her people? She walked in the way of the Lord. She didn't wring her hands hide or run from danger, she stood up for what was right and trusted in the God of Israel. Our Lord needs godly women to teach the gospel and work in his ways to save mankind. Surround yourself with godly women. They will make a difference in your life. Do you believe that? Do you surround yourself with godly women? Or do you have the type of friends that, make, that cause you to choose to sin? You know, we talk about marriage, so I'd like to say three words, marriage isn't easy. Nobody has a perfect marriage. I'm going to say something that may shock y'all. Nobody has a perfect life. Nobody has a perfect husband. Nobody has perfect children, and I'm here to tell you, even your grandchildren aren't perfect. They aren't, girls. And I'll tell you something else. Do you know that the church isn't perfect? Only Jesus was perfect right? We're just trying to get home to him, right? That's, right? That's what we're trying to do. And so we are imperfect people. You know what? We need to cut ourselves some slack. If God picks, okay, Exodus 34. I got to show you. We got to go. We got to go. Get your Bibles. In Exodus 34, Peggy, I'm liking this Bible. It has places to put your thumb. Exodus 34, Moses has asked God, you know, can I see your face? I know I can't, but can, and, Mo, and God has told him, you stand over there and I'll put your hand, you know, in the hall of the rock. Okay, Exodus 34, go to verse 6. Look how God describes God. Then the Lord passed by in front of him, who's the him? Moses. And he proclaimed, this is God proclaiming God. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness. Do you keep hearing loving kindness, girls? He starts off with compassionate, gracious, loving kindness, who forgives iniquity. What's iniquity? Tell me. Sin. Transgression and sin. Look at those three words. Yet, oh, do we ever see this word? Yet, you see, God gives you what he expects of you. And then he'll tell you what'll happen if you don't do it. So look at this passage. Yet, still talking about himself, he will by no means leave the guilty, what? Unpunished. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means in Becky's language. You aren't going to get away with anything. And neither am I. And I haven't. I don't know how, but my mother found out everything I was doing. I thought she had a phone hidden somewhere. And God called her every day to tell her what Becky was doing. <laughs> How did she know that? Mamas just know, right, girls? Mamas just know. He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Do we pay for our grandparents' mistakes and for something that they do? Yeah. It'll be, it'll be around. The reputation is there. Let's talk about marriage. Write this down. Be friends with your husband if you're married. Well, I give that advice. If you've ever seen the movie Shenandoah with Jimmy Stewart, when he has a beautiful daughter and Doug McClure is coming to ask for the hand of this girl, and he says to Doug McClure, do you like her? And Doug McClure says, well, I love her. And he says, no, 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 no. I want to know, do you like her? 
It's important that you like each other. There will be times that you think, I can't take it. Yeah, I know that. I know that. Be friends. Write this down. Go on a date. If you can afford it, escape from the kids. Have somebody who will come and babysit for you so that you can go take a walk. I just wanted, our kids were 20 months apart. I felt like I had twins. I just wanted to go outside and run or do something. You know, talk to somebody. This was hard when we had little children. As they grow older, it gets what, girls? Better. And when it comes to teenagers and people say, oh, teenagers, oh, no, teenagers in the house, I loved it. And I loved it when they were on summer break. We stayed up late. We watched movies all night long. Bob Newhart was our favorite sitcom. And we would watch that and laugh and eat and have fun, swim during the day, do whatever we could. I loved summers. Yes, there are hard times. You have to, write this down, Give them to God. I would go to Mama, and I would say, help me, Mama. Give me the words. See, she was my right hand. Or help me with Jeff. I don't understand this marriage. Mama, help me. Or I don't, the kids, Mama, help me. And she would give me these words. She would say to me, and God honest, be honest with your kids. She would say, you can't handle this. It's too much for you, Beck. So let's give it to God. Let's pray about it and let him handle it. Girls, that is your solution for anything every day in this life. You know why the begging place, and I've told Peggy this, why I think the begging place is so popular is because that's where we live. Don't you have something in your mind that just keeps reoccurring and you deal with it when you wake up in the morning and the last thing when you go to bed? I have so many people who come to me and they'll say, pray for my child. He's unfaithful. When they leave your home, girls, they're on their own and they will choose, right? Do they always make good choices? Did you? And you must remember your your childhood too. They don't always make the right choices. I was in, a, uh, in Denver at Bear Valley's lectureships, and Steve Higginbotham was talking, wonderful preacher. And the room was packed, auditorium was packed. And he stopped and he said, you know, and of course every, you could have heard a pin drop. He said, when my little boy was little, I used to pray. And this is the prayer of parents. Please protect him. Please don't let anything happen to him. Please keep him safe, right? Did you pray that prayer? And he said, my little boy grew up and left God. He said, that isn't my prayer anymore. He said, do you know what I pray? Lord, do what you have to do to bring him back. That's what you pray. Why? Because that soul is so important. And then my mother would tell me something else. There's two or three things I want to tell you. When she was having this conversation with me, after she told me I couldn't handle it, and then she'd look at me and she'd say this, after all, Becky... You can only save yourself. You need to write that down. You need to remember that. Because I would, you know, you'd rake yourself over the coals. And then, but wait a minute. You can't get your children to heaven. You can't get your grandchildren to heaven. I'd love to. That 11-year-old little boy with the orange hair who came into the room one time and said, Mimi, do you know, he heard me talking. He said, Mimi, you have the mind of a squirrel. And I do twirl, squirrel. You can only save yourself. Well, you know what? Do everything you can to get there. Do everything you can to get them there, but you're only going to get you. (laughs) That's the truth. There's something else I want to tell you about. Oh, Mama. She'd be laughing if she were here. The other day, if I can tell this, and I probably can't, but I'll try. Um, I told Reagan, and Cheryl was our driver, and they came and picked me up on Thursday from the airport. And I said, I had told them, I said, I want to go to the cemetery. I'm sorry. I never get to visit my parents anymore. You know, their grave is important to me. It gives me comfort. I know they're not there. 
they have flown away and I wouldn't bring them back. But sometimes, you know, as the years go by, I'm in Texas, I don't get back to Georgia. So they so kindly uh, took me to Noonan and I took them to the grave and I said, come here, meet my parents. <laughs> my parents were on the front row of the cemetery because they always wanted the front row seat. <laughs> and one time we were driving past the cemetery and you see, they already put the plate in the ground for my parents, but they didn't put any dates on it. And so we were going past the cemetery, and my mother looked up, and she noticed that there was a funeral home canopy right next to where they're going to be someday, where they are now. And my mother said, look, Russ, neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that so much, what you did for me. It's a comfort place. Not everybody feels like that, but it is for me. My mother told me, gut honest, when things were tough, how to handle it. We've got to have, so write this down, we've got to have women in our lives who will give us what we need to hear. It may be your mama, it may not be your mama. As a teenager, and anybody who's a teenager in here, have you ever argued, and then those of you who are older chicks, have you ever argued with your mother? <laughs> yeah, I know you did. Did you ever have, in just a battle, just a battle about something? Well, I was so much like my mother, she realized it, you know, okay, but she still would battle down to the mat with me. And we would be arguing about something that usually I wanted to do, it wasn't scriptural. I want to do this. I want to do that. And finally, she, she knew how to, she used um, reverse psychology. She would say, you go right ahead. You go ahead and do that thing. Whoa. And then she changed her tack again. And this time, it got real personal. She would tell me, God will never bless you if you do that. And that's the truth. And see, that, see, she brought God into the equation. So I had to listen to that, and then I thought, well, she's right. And before I could say any rebuttal, then she plunged the dagger. Now, you can giggle, but this one she meant with all of her being, and it made me cry every time she still does. She would say, Becky, one of these days I am going to die, and I will not be here. And I want you to know that when I get to, and I'm going to heaven. And when I get up to heaven, I'm going to find heaven's gate. And I'm going to go take my place. And I'm going to stand there until I see your face. You think I'm going to be bad then? You think I'm going to break mama's law and God's law then? No, I'm not going to. In the, in the pearl seeker, I have a page where there are three owls sitting on a branch. Have any of you ever seen the three owls? The first two owls are just doing everything perfectly, sitting straight, looking straight ahead. And the third one is backward swinging, you know, looking the other way, hearing the beat of the different drum, doing all these things, wanting to be the nonconformist. Anybody get that? I'm that third owl. I loved God, but I wanted to do things, the Frank Sinatra, my way. So let me get away from home. Let me go to college. Let me have some fun. Oh, you'll get in trouble. I was, I was determined to not listen to mom or dad or God. And after two miserable years, I realized this isn't working. You're not happy. And do you know what that third owl named Becky did? Flipped up on the branch acted right. Why? Because I was walking contrary to God's law, and I wasn't thinking right, and my heart was wrong. And you know what happened when I made it right? My life fell into place. And so I tell my sweet, sweet sisters, do I still hear the beat of a different drummer? Yeah, I do. But if it's against God's law, I don't go there. No more. This is the new back.
And you know that old self, talk about the old girl that appears that Patsy was saying comes back up in the water? That old girl tries to come, you know, we've killed her. She comes back up on the, under the ground and I stomp on her. You go back where you're supposed to be. I have let you go. I'm the new girl. Write this down. Women need each other. No matter how old we are, if you're the older woman helping the younger woman, Titus 2 tells you to help her. And if you're the younger woman who needs the older woman, go to her. She may not know you need her. Make the bridge happen. There are congregations where the older women and the younger women don't have anything to do with each other. And I tell you something, sweeties, I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong. Titus 2 teaches you not to do that. Listen, girls. God said, you know that old bumper sticker was, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's not the bumper sticker it should be. God said it, that settles it. Amen? Amen? I wanted to read you this. I was sitting, I was doing a, a ladies retreat with a bunch of women from Magnolia, Texas. Went to a congregation down there near Houston. And this one girl was sitting over, oh, kind of in the edge, and she started talking. The whole, it was one of those moments where everybody listened to what Amy is saying. So I had to say, Amy, write this down. i got to hear this again. This is Amy. For quite a while, I felt the need to find a church to attend. For years, I would drive to a church and not have the strength to even get out of the car. Can you imagine? She couldn't do it, girls. For some reason, I was terrified. Not sure of what or why. One day, I received the heart-to-heart -heart pamphlet. Do you know how much good that does? the heart-to-heart -heart pamphlet in the mail from the Magnolia Church of Christ. I enjoyed reading it and decided to attend one Sunday. My husband, neither was he a Christian, told me that if I got the strength to get out of the car and sit through a service, he would go with me one time. So the next Sunday, I drove to the church building, scared to death. In the parking lot, I talked to God, praying for strength to get out of the car. I got out and managed to walk, are you ready? 20 feet. Claire, now listen, Claire, one of the members, saw me and came running over. You're new here, she greeted me. Yes, I replied. She took my arm in hers and said, please sit with me. Girls, do you know how much that means? For you to tell, so have you ever sat alone? Have you ever been the newcomer? You go, sit, come sit with me. That was exactly what I needed. Everyone was so nice and friendly. The next Sunday I went back and again I was welcomed at the door and another couple invited me to sit with them. A short time later, I was baptized. My husband kept his word and came one Sunday and then another and then another and he was baptized a few months later. There are so many touching moments in Amy's story, but what Becky here loves the most is that when she stepped out of the car, a Christian sister stepped into her life. Why do you think we're here? No matter what age we are, there is somebody who needs us, and our work is set before us. Write down Matthew 28. You know in Matthew 28, God, uh, Jesus gives, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them, you know that. That is the church's marching orders. Did Jesus say, go into the auditorium, close the door, and don't ever talk about me to anybody? No. We've got to be talking. We've got to be doing. Let me see if I have any cards. I think I may have even given them away. We, yes, I have a few. If you feel like you can't talk to somebody or start the, con the conversation, this is an evangelistic tool. This is something I can do. It's hard for me to start, so I try to start thinking of how can I ask somebody, what church did you go to, or can I help you, or whatever. Our church makes these cards, and we put them in baskets all around the church building. People grab them. It has our uh, church address, how you can call us, our uh, times of meeting, and on the back, a gift from God. Everyone knows that God gave his son Jesus to save mankind from sin. Did you know the church is also a gift from God? It's made of people whom God has saved through Jesus. Do you want a Bible study? Come on. So we grab these. 
We leave them at restaurants. We leave them at the doctor's office. Let me tell you, whenever I have a guy that comes in wants to repair something, I've called him to come, I keep these on the foyer table. He comes in, okay, I have to start talking to old Beck. Come on, Becky, you can say something. And I'll say, what church do you go to? I don't care what he says. He may say, well, we don't go. Or he may say, we go just, I say, listen, here's our card. Come visit. Come, come sit. I sit on the third row on the left, look for the white hair, whatever. Come sit with me. Okay. And he'll go, you know, Lakeshore Drive Church of Christ. Well, I've been over to fix their dishwasher. And I'll say, well, you know where we are. Come. And then he goes to fix my dishwasher or whatever. I take another card. And I find his toolbox and I go put it in there. <laughs> because he might lose the first one, right? If you're... Anybody can have these printed yourself and done. This is a tool to can somebody on an airplane. It has a place for your name. If you're interested, they're up here. Copy. It's, can you do that? Nobody will refuse a card, girls. Every, that's a, that opens up the conversation. And it starts the conversation. How good that is. There are people, do not think that the gospel is obsolete. It isn't. You'll pick up, if you look at Dave Hart, H-A-R-T, on Facebook, he puts, he was putting on Facebook, and some people were getting upset, probably Facebook tuned him out for a while, who all was baptized that day. People, churches from all over the world, pictures, people being baptized. Do you know that there are people becoming Christians every day? Does that not encourage you? The gospel still works. God knew that. God knew every, every bit, and he knew whether or not you would obey the gospel. Have you ever heard the uh, saying, men are from Mars and women are from Venus? It's true. <laughs> Your children will leave home. Sometimes they'll come, <laughs> then sometimes they'll come back and bring their children, and they may live with you. Listen, a girl in Tennessee must have been about, she was 84 years old, came up to me and she said, Becky, I'm 84 years old and I'm raising my four grandchildren. And she said, do you know how old they are? From 18 to four. She's doing it all again. And I just looked at her with weary eyes and I said, how do you do this? And she said to me, I have to. She has no choice. It's the grandmother who picks them up and brings them to church. Well, thank God for grandmothers, Amen. that they'll do that. It's important. I've never forgotten her. Christian colleges are wonderful, if you can, but they're not perfect. Be aware of that, girls. Money is still tight. Maybe they've flown the coop. Do you know that my husband loves the quiet? I miss the noise. And yet, you know what else I've learned now that my grandchildren are as old as they are? Have you ever heard the expression, headlights, taillights? They're, they're driving in your driveway. Yay, they're here. And then they're leaving your driveway. Yay, they're going. <laughs> You're not having to pay their insurance anymore on that car. The bills, you know, they have to... I'll tell you one of the things that I loved the most was when my, our son, who's like me, the night owl, we, we were at his house. And uh, it was about, nine, about 10 o'clock, and he said, Night. I'm going to bed. And I went, you're going to bed? You know, the night is still young. And he said, Mom, I've learned that if I don't go to bed, I can't function the next day. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> you finally learned that, Jeffrey? I'm so glad. Girls, be at peace when your children leave and go to school. I remember when we took Jennifer her first year, the orienta orientation lady said, Hold on. You have raised your child for this moment. Let her go. After all, somebody else said, do you want your children back laying on the couch, eating potato chips, watching television? No, I don't want that. I want them to go on and to be successful. And I'll tell you something. My mother used to tell me, and oh, I know what she means. There is no higher peace and comfort that knowing that when I'm worshiping wherever I am, my children are worshiping where they are. I know that.
but they're in church too. That brings me such comfort. What do you do when they're not? Here's your clue. Pray. Give it to God. Pray for time. Pray for God to touch their hearts, right? Whatever it takes, keep on going. Whatever happens, you do the right thing. Well, Jeff is retired, and then he went back to work. He works three days in the bank, and it may d diminish after that. It's just, it's well enough that he goes to work right now. <laughs> he has no hobbies. I'm his hobby. <laughs> He's like this, Becky, you know what we ought to do today? No, what, I'm thinking movies? I'm thinking go out to eat? What are we gonna do? Why don't we clean out the garage? <laughs> I think I'm feeling sick. <laughs> I really don't feel good. You know, one older woman said, Becky, I feel for you and the sorry, sorrow you've had to bear in losing both your parents. It will happen, girls, that's life. But I want to tell you, wait until you lose your husband of many years. Widows, widows, what wonderful people they are. At Forest Park, we had a group of widows that sat on a long bench in the foyer. And I noticed when my kids were little that all the other kids were going up and there was probably eight on a bench. And the kids would start at one end and they'd hug every single widow. And I thought, okay, now that's a good thing to do with your kids. Let's start doing that. Do you know how much that meant to those girls, those widows? They got to feel a child's embrace again and they knew their names. And then when they started passing away, oh, it broke our kids' hearts. Because you know what? Write it down. We're family. And we need to be aware of every age. And you have a function and a job to do. And aren't you glad? Amen. Aren't you glad? As my mama used to say, I want to wear out. I don't want to rust out. Write down 1 John 5.14, which once again is the power of prayer. 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence from which we have before him that if we ask Anything. Did you hear that? Anything according to his will, what? He hears us. Our lives go on. Write down Romans 8, 28. God causes how many things, girls? All things to work together for good for whom? To those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. Let me tell you, the world misquotes this verse. They say, oh, God's going to work everything together for good. That's not what that verse says. There's a qualification if you love him, and if you're called according to what? His agenda. Girls, there's classes to be taught. There are people to be encouraged, teenagers to be loved, elders to be praised, and work to be done. And I know that there's men that are going to serve us today. How wonderful. You need to give all of them a holy kiss. I believe in holy kisses. <laughs> Tell them thank you. Thank you for serving. Our lives go on. No matter what happens, how you live your life, you live it according to what? God's way. You don't look to the left. You don't look to the right. You look straight ahead and up. Because that's where we're going. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. Write down Isaiah 46. I love this passage. You need to see this and underline it in your Bible. Isaiah 46. God speaking. in verses 3, 4, and 9. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age I shall be the same, and even to your graying years I shall bear you. I have done it, and I shall carry you, and I shall bear you, and I shall deliver who? You. Who says that? God. God knew us when we were young, when we were just born, when we had acne on our face, and then gray hair. And he continues to do what? Deliver us. This, whatever's bothering you in your life, whatever crisis you're in the middle of or it's getting ready to come and you know it is, let me tell you something. Smile. James 1. This test is going to make you better. And God is going to deliver you. What was Exodus 14, 14? The Lord will what? Fight for you. Then let him fight. 
Listen, girls, don't get in his work. Step back. Let him work. You'd just make a mess. I'd just make a mess of it, wouldn't you? But if you let him do it, oh, how wonderful it is. I heard this the other day, and I see if you can. This is Facebook, and I've added a word. A poem by Talia Hunter. A voice within me whispered, oh, <laughs> it's, all, it's all right. A voice within me whispered, your life will start to make a lot more sense once you learn to view it through the lens of where you are going rather than where you once were. And of who you are becoming rather than who you have once been. For life is lived only forwards, never backwards. And so long as you are committed to a path of growth, love, and learning, a bright future awaits you beyond all that you may presently dream and remember God. Paul wrote it this way. Write down Philippians 3, 4, 13 and 14. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. My mother closed one of her books with this. The book is over, the writing is done, the victory is finished and the battle is won. Life is not simple, sometimes a maze. But what really matters when truth I see, how was the gospel according to me? We started off today with the gospel. How Jesus came to this earth and left the plan. Write down Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And you go home and look at that. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, God says, oh, the plans I have for you. Yes, I know it's Old Testament, and yes, he's talking to his people, but are we not his people? And he does have plans for you, honey. And he does have plans for me. Let him work. As Mama was at the end of her life, close to it, I was called to the hospital in Noonan. She didn't die that weekend, but she would stop talking. I went in and stayed in her room. You ever st slept in this chair that makes into a bed? She wouldn't talk to me. She had t stopped communicating. And it was the middle of the night, and I couldn't sleep, so I scooted the chair over to the side of her bed, and I just started crying. And her eyes were closed. And I said, oh, Mama, why does this hurt so much? And her eyes opened up, and she spoke. And she said, it's because we love so much. You never know what they're thinking and listening, even though they're not communicating. What was she trying to tell me? Write it down. Women love so much. Listen, girls. We were last at the cross and first at the tomb. Don't tell me we don't know what's important. We do. Dwell on that. Think upon those things. Satan wants to turn your head, but he can't have you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So what do you do? You choose God. And when you do, it's the most wonderful life you will ever live. His daughter, his girl, yes, it's wonderful. Girls, you've been so sweet. I say this wherever I go. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. If our paths never cross again, I will see you in heaven, and that's a promise. At the gate, don't be late. <laughs> Love you. Thank you, girls. <laughs>